had every intention when I sat down to type up my message for this morning to be working on verses 6 through uh, 16. That was my thought. That was my plan. That was my hope. It didn't work. So we're only going to look at verses 6 through 11 um, this morning. Um, there's just too much here uh, that I think we need to give time to. Uh, so we'll do that. We ended last week's message, if you were with us, with verse 6. Obviously, we were in the midst of a sentence anyway. I want to pick up with verse 6 and use that as our, our springboard to move forward this morning. So let's begin reading there. Um, at Romans 2, verse 6, we read, Who will render to every man, this is obviously speaking of what God will do, render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. We're going to look at this section and try to make sense of it in light of Paul's ongoing argument here, his, his uh, presentation of the truth concerning man, uh, and deal with some issues that I think are a little troublesome here that we need to certainly think through this morning. That's why I, th I felt like we needed some extra time. I hope it will be helpful. I've entitled the message this morning, According to Your Deeds. According to your deeds. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we do come to you this morning confessing, as always, our uh, dependence upon your word. Uh, it is truth. It is life. It is what brings the sanctification that we need to transform our lives into the image of Christ, to make us acceptable in your sight, and to make us useful for your service, to fit us for the kingdom that you've promised to all those who are in Christ Jesus. So Lord, understanding this about the word, we realize how vitally important it is that we spend adequate time contemplating it, cons uh, considering it, seeking to interpret it, and then most importantly, Lord, trying to live in light of it. Lord, as always, I confess my inadequacy here, humanly speaking, Lord, I, I do not pretend to understand your truth in my own flesh, and I do not have even the ability to articulate truth in a way that can help others. So, Lord, we are dependent upon your spirit to both help us understand and then apply the truth that is found here in this text. Would you, for your glory and for your purposes, do that for us today, Father? Help us to do our part. May we pay attention. May we give our minds to it. May we think through what's being uh, taught about here through the, through the Apostle Paul, your servant. But then, Father, we pray you would take it and do in our lives with it what only you can do. And we're thankful for what you will do. And we praise you in advance for what you will do. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure I've said this already in this study in uh, the book of Romans in the past, but we are considering a very difficult passage of Scripture to interpret this morning. And when you read our text this morning, you are immediately aware that some of the teaching that seems at least on the surface to be spoken about in our text this morning would contradict other seemingly plain teaching of Scripture. Now, I would stop right there and say anybody that's been in, in uh, my Sunday school class where we've been dealing with biblical interpretation, we have already focused on one of those, those, uh, uh, those truths that we always need to interpret the obscure by what is plain, and we're going to do that this morning as well. But you cannot, in that sense, as well say, well, since we have plain and we're struggling with the obscure, that the obscure doesn't matter. It does. It's still God's truth as well. So we have to do our part to properly understand it, properly interpret it, and apply it to our lives, and then grapple, and it's an honest grappling, grappling within ourselves, what does this mean in relation to other things that seem so clearly to have been spoken by God within his word? That's what we're going to attempt by God's grace to do this morning. Now, if you remember last Sunday's sermon, we entered into chapter 2, and I mentioned even when we did this that there's a great debate among Bible interpreters over who's being spoken of in this particular section that we've entered into. Is this Paul's teaching, at least in the first part of chapter 2? Is he dealing with moral Gentiles? In other words, people who are still of the Gentile nations but maybe have not lived lives quite as reprobate as those that we discussed at the end of chapter 1. Is he speaking about Jews? Jews? 
who obviously would see themselves as separate from the Gentiles, and, and rightfully so. They were the chosen people of God. They had the law given to them. They had the covenant promises afforded them. So is he talking about Jews speaking out or thinking in line with what he has spoken at the end of chapter 1? Or is he dealing with both? And I took the approach as we started into chapter 2 last week that I think we ought to at least remain open to the possibility that Paul is speaking of both to moral Gentiles and Jews. And I think at least looking at it that way helps it to have more application to us. For the vast majority of us here would be Gentiles. And really, I think what he is saying here would apply to a lot of us who are raised in the United States of America in a Christian nation. Many of us raised even in Christian families and homes. The way that we need to guard ourselves against an improper understanding of our own sin. The, the, the fact that many of us would kind of excuse ourselves. Because comparing ourselves with others, we'd say, ah, I haven't done those things that other people have done. Therefore, I must be more acceptable to God. And that's certainly what Paul is getting at here in our text. Helping us to understand, are we more acceptable to God? All right? In our verses, which we will consider today, we're going to find that commentators and Bible ter interpreters are split again over Paul's teaching in this section. And they wonder this. In our text this morning, is Paul describing two groups of lost people? In other words, two groups of, of men, two individuals that he speaks about here who are both outside of the saving grace of God. Or is he speaking to two groups of people, and one of those groups of people would be redeemed people, and the other people would be lost individuals? And I would say, again, uh, as I've wrestled with this throughout the week and as I've read many respected commentators on this, it's going to be impossible for us to know for sure. Uh, it's just because Paul doesn't give us enough information here to know. And that's one of the things that makes our text so difficult to interpret this morning. But at the risk of sounding dismissive on the other side, I would say this, I don't think it really matters. At the end of the day, whether Paul envisioned as he was writing this, that one of these groups that he was represent that he was speaking of were actually redeemed individuals, I'm confident, and I'm going to bring this out at the end of our message this morning, I think it could only be spoken truly of people who are redeemed. For the rest of the scriptures are emphatic in their testimony that only those who have been redeemed by God's grace, by God's power through Jesus Christ, could ever have any hope of experiencing the positive elements that Paul describes concerning one of the individuals in his discussion in our text today. So again, regardless of your approach to this text, whether you believe Paul is speaking about two lost groups or whether he's talking about a lost and saved group, I hope at the end of the day we'll all come to the conclusion that our only hope, again, is the power of the gospel. And that's been Paul's argument the whole way through the book of Romans. We've said this many times. We've come back to it because it has to anchor us. Paul has already established that it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that he's not ashamed of because it alone is the power of God into salvation. And all of these other truths really hinge on that. These are all explaining why it is that the gospel is what it is and why we so desperately need it in our lives. So as we begin to, to approach our text this morning, I want to get our minds thinking about something Jesus said, because I think it can illustrate and help prepare us for what we're going to look at this morning. And if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, you can to Matthew chapter 7. These are some words that Jesus spoke in his Sermon on the Mount. And I want to use them as kind of a springboard to get us started. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, in the midst of his sermon, Jesus sees, says these things. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to the destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, in that, those two verses that made up just one or two small sentences in his sermon, Jesus affirmed that in this world, there are really only two types of people. There are people who are traversing, Jesus said, a very broad way, which leads to a very wide gate that everyone who enters through that gate goes into destruction. Obviously, speaking of eternal judgment, eternal damnation, so many different terms that the scripture uses to describe that. He also says, on the other hand, there are another group of people who are traversing a very narrow way, which leads to a very straight or restricted gate that those who enter through gain life. He just says there in Jesus' words, but we know he's speaking about eternal life, the, the life that only God can give to those individuals who presently are lost in their sin. And while Jesus' teaching informs us that there are only these two types of people within the world, he also reminds us of this sobering fact, 
many, Jesus says. In other words, the vast majority of people are following and will continue to follow the broad way that's leading to, to destruction. While only a relatively few people, Jesus says, will ever traverse this narrow way that leads to life everlasting. Now, with these thoughts in mind, I think our text in Romans is going to actually reaffirm Jesus' teaching here. But we need to remind ourselves, I had to do this myself, and we need to keep this always anchored, that Paul is choosing to bring out his teaching as a refutation to the moralist. Whether we believe it's a moral Jew, or whether we believe it's a moral uh, Gentile that, that's thinking here, or that's, that's being spoken about here, Paul, what he says today is part of his refutation of the moralist claim that he's not guilty of the sins that Paul has just discussed at the end of Romans chapter 1. Last Sunday, I pointed out as we began chapter 2 that Paul uses a, a literary device called diatribe. In this, he makes a fictional character, and he argues back and forth with this fictional character in order to get his point across. The moral man, Paul says, the religious person, if it's the ethnic Jew, cannot stand in judgment of those who sin Paul condemned in chapter 1, thinking that somehow they're better than those individuals. Paul says that those who stand in the judgment of other sins are guilty of the very same sins themselves. And Paul went on to say that God's judgment against the moralist will be even more severe, if that's at all possible, because the moralist, he says, has received the riches of God's goodness and the forbearance and the long-suffering of God, which Paul said should lead men to repentance, but in the case of these individuals, it did not. So Paul said, in their hardened and impenitent hearts, they are actually treasuring up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath that is going to come upon humanity in the day of God's judgment. Now we concluded last Sunday's message with verse 6, which says, God will render to every man according to his deeds. And that's where I want to start our consideration of our text this morning as well. And to understand what Paul means there and what, what is true in this, we need to also anchor that with what Paul had already said in verse 2. He says, we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those which commit such things. What is Paul saying? What is Paul's argument here as he built his case here before the judge, if you will, before the, the court that, that, that day? Paul is saying every man will ultimately find himself judged by God according to his deeds. Every man is going to be judged by God according to what he has done. And Paul says, we can be assured that this judgment is going to be truthful. In other words, it'll be honest, it'll be accurate, it'll be appropriate. So every man is going to have to face God one day. And he's going to have to give an accounting of what he's done. And God is not going to, you know, he's not going to shift things around. He's not going to make it easier on some or harder on others. He's not going to, you know, allow some things to skirt aside or, or come down harsher on other things over here. No, God's going to deal with it all in integrity. He's going to be truthful. He's going to be honest. He's going to judge it exactly as it is and what they need. It, in light of what Jesus said, as we opened up our discussion today, we could say this. What Jesus described as two pathways that individuals must be walking on one or the other, Paul describes as two kinds of lifestyles, what people are doing. In Jesus' teaching, you are either on the broad pathway that's leading to destruction, or you're on the narrow pathway which is leading to life everlasting. In Paul's teaching today, we will see that you are either living one lifestyle or another. And that God renders perfect judgment upon your lifestyle will render perfect judgment in the day of his final judgment. Now, before we even go any further, we, I think we see why there is such a struggle with this as people try to interpret this text. Does not even what we've already considered this morning seem to be implying that our eternal destinies are being determined by what we do in this life. By what our actions are. By what our if we want to use that word, our works are. And the only answer that somebody could give to our text, at least so far today, is yes. It does appear to be that that is what Paul is saying here. And in one sense, I would say this, that is exactly what Paul is saying. He's not, he's not trying to mince his words. He's not trying to say something in a cloaked way so that it could have all this double meaning, all these things. No, Paul is stating something very matter-of-factly. 
every man is going to one day stand before God and be judged according to his deeds. God's going to judge him based upon what he does. On the other hand, though, we know from the whole teaching of Scripture, it informs us that salvation is only possible by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe ultimately that's exactly what Paul is saying in our text this morning as well. And he wants to get that across in terms and ways that we cannot in any way miss the point that he has. So with all that background, let's begin. Let's start into our text this morning in earnest. Paul is going to bounce back and forth a little bit in his presentation today, but he really is only speaking again of two types of people and two outcomes for those people. And for lack of better terms, I'm going to I'm going to break these two groups down into two terms, two types of people, righteous people and unrighteous people. Let's begin by what Paul says about the righteous people. And we see that in verses 7, 10, and 11. Let's read those verses. He says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor in an immortality, eternal life. And then if you jump down to verse 10, he says, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. All right? So Paul describes this group of people by what they do and by what they seek after. What is it that they do? Well, Paul tells us up front what they do in verse 7. He says, they by patient continuance in well-doing. That's what this group of people does. The phrase patient continuance is, a, is the, the translation of a Greek term that means to persevere, to endure, to continue on in something. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones gave an illustration, a biblical illustration I thought was very helpful in trying to understand what Paul seems to be getting at here, and that was Jesus' parable concerning the sower and the seed. Remember, he says the sower went out to sow, and he cast his seed, and that seed fell in four different types of soil, right? The first one, he said, fell by the wayside. And because it fell by the wayside, which was all batted, you know, matted down because of all the traffic and, and everything going on there, it was hard, it was impenetrable, and the seed just lay on the surface. And then he says, you know, the birds came by and snatched up the seed, and it had none effect. And, and Jesus went on to say, the birds here are illustrating Satan. Satan comes along, he snatches up the word of the kingdom so that it can have no power, no impact in the lives of those who are, their lives are manifested by this wayside, this hard ground. He also said, though, there is other seed that falls upon stony ground. This obviously is stone is kind of, uh, ground is kind of a mixture of, of rocks and, and other things as well as dirt. And when the seed falls there, it does find some ability to, to find some germination, and it begins to sprout up. But then Jesus goes on to say, because of the way the soil is, because of all the rocks and everything else, that it's never able to take root. It's never able to get really established. And when the sun comes up and beats down upon it with its rays, it dies out. And it passes off the scene. And you don't get any value or benefit from it. Jesus said there's other seed that when the sower throws it, it falls on ground that's filled with thorns. But because this ground is filled with thorns, yes, there's dirt there. Yes, when the, when the seed falls, it does germinate. It begins to sprout up, and it looks promising. But then Jesus goes on to say that these thorns represent the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and these things begin to crowd in upon this life, what appears to be life, and chokes it out so that it does not continue on. It does not maintain itself. It certainly never produces any of the fruit that the sower had in mind when he threw the seed out at the last, at, in the first place. And then finally and fourthly, he said that there is some seed that falls on good ground. And when it falls on this good ground, it not only takes root, and not only springs up and begins to germinate and grow, but he says it, it thrives and it produces fruit. And he goes on to say some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So, likewise, Paul tells us that only those individuals who with patient continuance, those with perseverance, those with endurance, those who continue on in this way of life will be able to stand in God's day of judgment. But what kind of patient continuance is he, does he have in mind here? Well, he goes on, he says this, those who practice patient continuance in well-doing, the phrase well-doing here comes from a Greek word agathos, which means something that's good, something that's positive. Moral deeds and actions, I think we could say Paul has in mind here. 
Now, while Paul does not define this well-doing, what he does go on to say later in the text that we won't have time to get to this morning in verses 12 through 15, he brings in the idea of God's law. And it seems fair to assume that by well-doing, Paul is thinking of the righteous deeds and actions which are in conformity to God's righteous demands upon creation. All right, those things that are found in his law. So the righteous person is one whose life, Paul says, is epitomized by a patient continuance in well-doing. But we also learn from what Paul teaches here, this is not all that these individuals do, or it's not only important what they do, this patient continuance in well-doing, but it's also important what these individuals seek after in their life. And he goes on to say that. What do they seek? Well, at the end of verse 7, he says this. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. So Paul says the righteous individual seeks after in their life now three things. And each of these three things would appear in the context to relate to the desire of this individual to experience these things or to become these things or to see these things realized in their own life. The first thing that Paul says is they are seeking after glory. Just a common word, doxa, that we find in our, in our scriptures often dealing with this idea. It deals with brilliance. It deals with splendor. It's often spoken about God himself, and it, it seeks to display the, the greatness of God, that which sets God off of, apart from all others, that makes him stand out among any other entity. Used in this way, it seems as if Paul is saying these individuals desire to not only glorify God in their lives, that's certainly a part of it, but they also want to be able to rightly reflect the glory of God in their lives. Think about it this way. How was man created? Genesis tells us man was originally created in the image of God. But we know that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, specifically Adam as the federal head, when he chose to rebel against God, that glorious image of God became severely marred. So severely marred by sin that in many ways it's almost unrecognizable. And as that sin continues to take root and have its effect upon mankind from generation to generation, you begin to see men who seem to go so far away from God's desired expectation for their life that many would say, we don't even see any resemblance of godliness in them at all. But Paul says these individuals who by, you know, patient endurance, by, by this desire to do well dealing, they're seeking after glory. In other words, they want to see the glory of God recaptured in their life. I think Paul intimated that in his letter to the Corinthians when he said this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, and he was speaking there of Christians, but we all with open face as beholding in a glass, in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The people that Paul has in mind here are individuals who are not patiently enduring in their good works, but they are people who the, the sole aspiration of their life is this. They want to see the glory of God's image returned to them. They want their lives to accurately display the glory of God. We could say it this way. They want to be like Christ. They want to emulate the life of Jesus in their own lives. But that's not their only desire. Paul goes on to say not only do they desire glory, but they also desire honor. To me, value, nobility, respect, preciousness is a synonym of this word. This concept seems to be the desire of the righteous to meet with God's approval. Peter said this in his epistle, writing to the Corinthians, he was writing to there in 1 Peter 1.7, he said this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. In other words, what is the attitude of this person who with perseverance is, is continuing to go on in well-doing? He's seeking after glory. He wants to see the image of Christ in his life accurately displayed, and he also desires honor. We could say it this way. He's looking forward to meeting God at some point in the future and having God be able to honestly say about him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've actually done what I want you to do. You've actually been living the life I've asked you to live. You're actually living a life that is worthy of my honor. This is something that this man is seeking after. 
And then thirdly, he says, this person is also seeking after immortality. He's seeking after something that would be imperishable. He's seeking after something that is incorruptible. Paul says these individuals understand that corruption, death, destruction are all the results of God's curse upon the sins of mankind. These individuals currently are laboring, even in their sin-cursed bodies, seeking to glorify God in their lives, but all too aware of the limitations of their present corruptible flesh. Have you ever been there? I want to try to glorify God, but oh my goodness, it's so hard. Every time I take one step forward in trying to honor God in my life, it seems like I take two steps back. Where does that come from? Why is it when I just want to please God, there are so many enticements, so many entanglements, so many things that seem to trip me up and keep me from doing what I really in my heart want to do? Paul says these people, because they have such a heart for God and want to glorify in their life, they're longing for a day to come when they'll be able to lay aside this body once and for all. When they'll be able to no longer have the temptations and the trials and the difficulties of this fallen world to have to deal with anymore. And they will be put into a position by God's grace and glory to be able to glorify and honor him just like they want to do. Are you looking for that day? <laughs> These people are, he says. I think we could look to Paul's words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57, where he writes this. Now, this I say, brethren, flesh and blood, talking about this physical body here, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. But Paul says, I show you a mystery. I've got something to unveil to you. You're going to like this. We shall not all sleep. We won't all die in that sense physically, but we will all be changed. He's speaking, obviously, of Christians here. In a moment, he says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, Paul says, must put on incorruption. This mortal, he says, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, Paul writes. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, guess what, Christians in Corinth? I've got good news. <laughs> if you are in Christ, if this is true concerning you, then there's coming a day whether you've died already physically before Jesus Christ returns or whether you are alive and remaining when Jesus comes back, that when that trump sounds, this old flesh is going to be laid aside. And you're going to receive a glorified body just like God intended from the beginning. And you're going to be in a position to finally glorify him. So he says, where is your sting, O death? I'm not afraid of death, Paul says, because death opens up all of these things I've been hoping for and dreaming about and desiring in my life because there's nothing I want to do more than glorify God with my life. Paul says, this is how these righteous individuals live. And since, as Paul has said, God's judgment is always according to truth. And since God renders, Paul says, unto every man according to his deeds. In other words, he gives us exactly what we deserve based upon what we have done. Individuals living like this, Paul says, are going to receive from God eternal life. Beyond this, he wrote in verse 10, in addition to the eternal life, or maybe in describing the eternal life, they're going to receive from God glory, honor, and peace. This will be given by God to every man that worketh good. Paul says, I don't care where these Jew or Gentile. It's going to come to the Jew first, and it's going to come to the Gentile. Now, we do need to keep this anchored in the text, in the context. Paul's words that he's given here are being spoken to self-professing moralists. It's being spoken to individuals that Paul knew were judging the sins of others that he's just described at the end of chapter 1, and by judging others believes they must be more acceptable in the eyes of God. So Paul, writing to this individual, thinking that, he says, you know what, you're right. God will truly accept righteous people. And he says, if there's people out there who with patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, God is going to reward those people with eternal life. Not only this, Paul writes... He's going to give those individuals glory, honor, and peace. He does this to every good person, whether those people are Jews 
or whether they're Gentiles. Well, glory be. So as we read this this morning, I guess the only question we honestly have to ask ourselves in light of this teaching is this. Is that an accurate description of me? Have I, with patient endurance, is my life typified by pursuing good, well-doing? From sunup to sundown is a thought that's always encompassing me as I want to glorify God and I want to see his glory manifested in my life. I'm doing every decision I make today, every action I undertake, every thought of my mind is going to be governed by the fact of will this honor God? Or will it cause him to one day say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? And will this be, is everything in my life focused on that idea that there's coming a day by God's grace, thank the Lord, there's coming a day where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have all of even the hindrances and the struggles to live this way taken away from me, and I'm going to be freed up to finally fulfill my inner desire, which is to glorify God in everything in my life. Hey, if that's your mindset this morning, as you honestly evaluate your life, you're in good shape. Or as Jesus would say, you're on the narrow way. The narrow way that leads to life everlasting. But as you're considering yourself in light of Paul's teaching this morning, before you render a final verdict, maybe it would be good for us to go on and see what he says about the other individual. Okay? We'll call these people the unrighteous. And they're found in, described in verses 8 and 9. Paul says this, But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what will they receive? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, Upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. And we probably ought to include in that what he said at the end of verse 11 too. For there is no respect of persons with God. What is it that the unrighteous that Paul speaks about here, what is it that they do? Paul describes these individuals as being contentious. That's a... Uh, uh, a translation of a Greek word that seems to carry the idea of factiousness, any of those that are striving, dividing. And probably the striving and the dividing, the factiousness, the contentiousness comes from having continually self desires. In other words, because I want what I want, <laughs> that puts me at odds with other people who want what they want. And so I constantly find myself contentious, factious, warring with other individuals. All right? Jesus told us that God's law can actually be broken down into two basic compartments or commandments. He said, they are this, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, Paul would tell us in our text this morning that the unrighteous individual, because he only loves himself, and because he only seeks to serve one person, that is himself, that he obviously is not fulfilling God's commandments because he's serving self over God, and he's serving self over others. So the unrighteous man is contentious, Paul says. And then he goes on to says, and he says, they do not obey the truth. The phrase there and the idea of truth there seems to be, they don't obey those things that correspond to what is real. And I think obviously we'd have to think of that in light of all the biblical teaching that Paul must have in mind here what God has declared is real. Maybe not what we think is real based upon our own lives. So this individual, Paul says, refuses to obey the truth. Why is it that they refuse to obey the truth? could be two reasons. One of the reasons why they refuse to obey the truth is because they've convinced themselves <laughs> that they know what truth is. They have their own truth, in other words. They've made up their truth, and therefore, in that sense, they think positively, I am following truth. I am pursuing truth. What God has revealed about himself to every man in his creation, the righteous man twists. We've seen it. We understand it. We know it in our own lives. He distorts. And sometimes, he just simply outright disobeys. He says, I may know what God said is truth, but I don't care. I don't want to do what God says. I don't want to order my steps based upon what God has said is true. I want to do it my own way. So what God says man must do, this man refuses to accept. He believes he has the right to determine his own set of values. He has the right to determine for himself what should be acceptable conduct? And this person, whether they would ever say it or not, actually believes this. This falls right in line with what Paul had said earlier at the beginning of this chapter. They actually believe that the way they've chosen to order their steps, God ought to, he's almost bound to accept it. 
Because we convinced ourselves that what I am doing is the right thing. Therefore, God must accept what I'm doing. Because we made up our own truth. We live with the spirit of Pilate as he was talking with Jesus that day, <laughs> standing in judgment. What is truth? <laughs> truth. Nobody can know truth. Truth for you is you. Truth for me is me. Who cares what truth is? Truth is something that we just kind of decide for ourselves. What is truth? We know this, though. The Bible's clear. There is truth. <laughs> and there is falseness. There are lies. There is right and there is wrong, whether we choose to agree to it or not. Paul goes on to say this man, what he does choose to obey is not the truth. What he chooses to obey is unrighteousness, wickedness, evil, and wrongdoing. Because this individual refuses to obey the truth, he rather now practices unrighteousness. He may convince himself in his twisted mind that what he is doing is not wrong, but what he is doing is walking in direct defiance of what God has expressly declared righteousness to be. And often, even when he knows that, he desires, that what he desires to do flies in the face of the righteous conduct that God has explained within the word, he pursues it anyway. Because it is the only thing he is concerned with pleasing, and the only thing he's concerned with obeying is his own fleshly desires. The thought of what God wants really never enters into this person's mind, except perchance when he's considering the idea that there might come judgment one day if I've lived a life in defiance to God. But that's really selfish ambition too, right? I'm fearful of punishment because I don't want anything bad to happen to me. <laughs> but that's the only time he thinks about it. The only time he even considers doing the right thing is not because it would glorify God, but because it would keep me from having to suffer any more pain or suffering. It's still that selfish mindset. We find ourselves wondering if we wonder what unrighteousness really is, well, all we have to do is look back to chapter 1. Paul described unrighteousness to us there by describing the sins of mankind. Because this is who this individual is, because this is what he does, then Paul goes on to express what this individual can expect to receive from God. Paul says he's going to receive from God indignation and wrath, and he's going to receive tribulation and anguish. The four words seem to be paired off into two pairs, and the two pairs speak to what this individual can expect to receive from God, and then the effect it's going to have upon them. Indignation and wrath. You, I don't expect you to remember this. It would be nice if you did. But we were talking about the wrath of God back in Romans chapter 118. I said there are two different Greek words in the Bible that speak of, of wrath, and even God's wrath. One of them is the word thymos. It was the idea, carried the idea of fury and rage. It is a state of intense displeasure. It is an explosion of anger. All right? And then there was orgy. That was the one that was found in Romans, Romans chapter 118. It is a feeling of strong displeasure and hostility. We said it is almost like a lingering, smoldering hostility toward the disobedience and rebellious actions of men. You know, in our text this morning, Paul is using both of those terms, and they're translated uh, indignation and wrath. God's smoldering displeasure with unrighteous man's sin, his orgy, that which we described in Romans chapter 118, he said, is, is going to explode in fury. It's going to explode in thymos in the coming day of God's judgment. This is the position of the unrighteous individual who's going to find himself in before God. God, in a sense, has been... <laughs> he's been allowing this to go on. It's not that he's been happy with it. It's not that he's overlooked it. It's not that he's not angry about it. His wrath has been kindling toward this all along. But because this person's life is all wrapped up in just serving themselves with no desire about the things of God, this lingering, smoldering wrath of God is going to come to a climax one day and it's going to explode in the fury of Almighty God upon these individuals. He says, in the day of his wrath is going to be poured out upon these individuals because of the way that they've lived. And because this is true, Paul goes on to say, these individuals experience tribulation and anguish. Tribulation, trouble, distress, persecution. And the word anguish carries the idea of distress or hardship. I think these words re represent the effect that God's judgment on man's sin has upon individuals. Often we're experiencing some of that tribulation even in our life right now. You know what, folks? There are natural consequences for our sin. You and I know it. 
when we live in disobedience to God's ways, you cannot help but feel the impact of it in your life. One, we're facing it just because we're under the curse of man's sin under Adam. We, we were born dying. <laughs> you know, oh, the precious little baby, what a wonderful new life. Well, yeah, it's a new life that's dying because that's the impact of sin. But as we go on in our lives and we continue to sin, we begin to feel the impact of that, right? You know, when I sin against the you know, hey, I don't like Will, and I, I tell him so, I'm liable to get a plug right in the nose. He's going to fight back. If I steal, I can expect if I'm caught to have to go to jail, <laughs> pay a punishment, and some cultures lose my hands. If I continue to live promiscuously and engage in sex with all kinds of partners, I should not be shocked one day when I wake up with a venereal disease. There are natural consequences to sin. And as we continue to pursue these sins, this tribulation, this persecution comes upon us. Some of it's just the natural things. Some of it is the things that God himself begins to pour out upon the sins of men. And that begins as it builds and as it goes on, it brings anguish into the individual's lives. They begin to understand the impact of this and they... They begin to weigh, it weighs upon them, and they begin to feel the effects of it to the point where they, they despair of life itself. Remember Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man fared sumptuously every day, had everything he could ever need. Lazarus, this poor beggar, sick with sores, laying at the rich man's doorstep, having to eat the slop, you know, eat the, eat the trash, you know, root in the garbage. The, the dogs came and licked his sword. Nobody cared about him, certainly not that rich man. They both die. <laughs> And they woke up in completely different places. And the rich man, we know, right, wakes up in torment, we are told, languishing in the flames. And he cries out to Father Abraham, and he said, Father Abraham, would you please send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in some cool water and just touch the tip of my tongue because I'm in torment here. We could say he's in anguish here. He's suffering the just retribution for his ongoing rebellion against God. And Father Abraham's answer to him was what? I'm not sending Lazarus to you. One, he can't come to you because your fates are sealed. You're in one place, he's in another. There's a great goal fixed. Nobody's going from one side to the other. He can't come to you. But beyond that, you don't deserve him to come to you. He says, do you remember your life here on earth? God gave you every good thing to enjoy. And Lazarus, he got nothing. And you know what now? Lazarus gets all these good things to enjoy, and you're in torments. This is the result of our sin. It brings this anguish into our lives because of our sins. This is the righteous reward of every unrighteous individual. To the Jew first, Paul says, and also to the Gentile. Being a Jew, Paul wanted them to realize, provided no guarantee that any individual could escape such judgment, for God will judge all people according to their deeds. And being a Gentile, Paul wanted them to also know, afforded no individuals an excuse for their actions. They could say this, well, I'm not the Jew. I didn't have the privilege of the law. I didn't get the Ten Commandments. I never had God living among my town. Paul says, no, you're going to be judged for what you did as well. And you're going to suffer the righteous retribution for what you have done done. Later he'll go on and tell why that is, because God gave you a law too. <laughs> one you cannot escape, and one every one of you acknowledges. So the Gentile who lives unrighteously will suffer God's judgment just as the unrighteous Jew. Why? Because God says, I'm no respecter of persons. And why? Because God says, I always judge according to truth. I give you what you deserve. So as we think about this individual, we ask ourselves this question is this, is this an accurate description, an honest description of who I am? Am I contentious? Do I disobey truth? Do I practice unrighteousness? If I do that in the words of Jesus, I'm on the broad way that's leading to destruction. Do you see why this passage causes so much struggle? <laughs> if we honestly read our Bibles and come to what Paul says here, we say, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, I think we've got a problem here. Here's our problem. God exercises righteous judgment. God didn't pull any punches. He doesn't, 
excuse any sins. He's going to judge us. God, Paul says he's going to judge each and every one of us accurately based upon the way that we lived. And Paul says, because that's true, folks, you moralists that think that somehow you're going to be acceptable in the eyes of God, because this is true, you just need to understand this. Those whose lives consisted of only righteous deeds, <laughs> a continual pursuance of good, a continual desire of glory, hope, and immortality, those individuals, he says, they're in good place. They're going to gain eternal life one day. But he says, on the other hand, those lives who who's have consisted of unrighteous deeds, those who have been contentious, those who have not obeyed the truth, those who have practiced unrighteousness, they are going to suffer God's eternal wrath. And I say, Pastor, doesn't the Bible clearly teach that no man can be saved, no man can ever have right standing in the face of, Jesus, of God the Father except by their faith, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his son. And I would say, yes, it does. Without question, the Bible teaches here. That being the case, as we seek to interpret the obscure by what is clear and plain and irrevocably understood in our lives, Paul's teaching here must indicate that apart from Jesus Christ, apart from what Jesus stands ready not only to um, help us to escape through his suffering on our behalf, the righteous retribution of God upon our sin, but also upon the impartation of his righteousness to our account and even to our lives as we continue to live in the giving of his Holy Spirit and the promise of glorification in the future, apart from what Jesus could give to us, no person could ever attain eternal life. No man's life has been good enough. And if you are honest this morning and we evaluate our lives by what Paul says here, we would have to be honest and say, I can't have eternal life based on the way I've lived. In fact, based on the way I live, I deserve the eternal judgment of God, rightfully so, upon my sin. And you know what, folks? I would say, I think that's an accurate interpretation of Paul's teaching because all along Paul has been trying to impart this to the Romans. Sinful man is hopeless and undone in himself. There is nothing he can do to save himself. He is under the wrath of Almighty God and rightfully so. <laughs> but he doesn't say it here. He's already said it and I can't leave this message without saying it again. But the power of the gospel can change that. power of the gospel can change that. And you know what, folks? If when I was describing the righteous individual late earlier in the sermon, and you're sitting there in your pew, and you're thinking through these things, you know what? You're saying, I know I haven't been perfect. But as the general tenor of my life since at least the time I've accepted Christ as my Savior, I understand I do have this persevering desire to try to do the right thing. No, I don't always do it. I haven't perfectly done it, but I do desire that. And, you know, as I look at my life in light of what Paul is saying here, I do realize that in the depths of my soul, there is something that burns within me that really wants to glorify God and, and be all that I should be for God. I want to have my life really depict the glory of God. And Deep down in, in the depths of my heart, even though there are times I, I, I sometimes ignore that and go astray from it, there's something down inside of me that has this great hope that someday I'm going to be able to see all of this fulfilled in my life. That someday I might be able to stand before God and hear him say, well done now, good and faithful servant. And one of the reasons, Pastor, while I so crave the fact that there's coming a day when I'm going to say aside this robe of flesh and, and going to be escaping this sin-cursed world is because I really do want to please God, but I, I'm always fighting because there's all of these things that seem to be holding me back and I can't wait to get rid of it. So I'm hoping and expecting and waiting for immortality because that's going to be the greatest day ever. You know what, in light of all that Paul has said here today, if you found yourself being able to agree, none of us could say, I do this perfectly, but be able to agree that, you know what, that really is a big part of my life. 
The answer, Paul doesn't give it here, but he's already given it. You know the reason why you even have those feelings and expectations in your heart? The power of the gospel. You know the power of the gospel has the ability to give you a brand new heart? The power of the gospel has the ability to give you a brand new life? The power of the gospel has the ability to give you brand new desires? Brand new hopes? Brand new dreams? Brand new aspirations? This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation. Do you realize what the gospel did to me, Paul said? Do you realize what I've seen it done to countless hundreds and thousands of people I proclaimed it to? Do you know now since the 2,000 years since Paul read this, do you know how many millions of people have experienced the power of the gospel? So no, none of us are going to be able to stand under Paul's declaration here in our own strength, but the reality is... There are some of us that are going to be able to stand there by the grace of God. And when we get to glory one day, and God, by his grace through Jesus Christ, totally eradicates what remains of our fallenness, and it's gone, we're not only going to be able to stand in God's presence and not be consumed, we're going to belong there. We're going to be acceptable citizens of the heavenly kingdom. <laughs> but nobody's going to be walking around the streets of gold saying, <laughs> look at what I did look at me I'm here because I deserve to be here we're all going to be saying see that guy he's the reason I'm here you know the reason why I actually am in heaven and belong here it's what Jesus did for me he changed my life and Paul said, that's why the gospel is the gospel. Nobody can accept a plan to stand before God in the power of their own flesh because we all have fallen fall short of God's righteous expectations for our lives. But there's one man who perfectly honored God's righteous expectations. And that's Jesus. And then rather than just descending back into God's glory and saying, God, see, I proved it could happen. I showed him what it could be. No. He said, here's what I'm going to do, God. You take all of the judgment that every one of those individuals deserves, rightfully so, for their sin. You lay it on me. And I'll take it. And I'll bear it. And I'll suffer it. And I'll die beneath it that your wrath might be satisfied in me, dear Father, so that they could be declared righteous because of their faith in me. You know what, folks? If you see what God's expectation is and the fact that you fall so far short of it, there is really only one answer for any of us. It's repenting. It's turning from all of my own efforts and all of my own sinful inadequacies, and it's casting myself upon the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Laying hold of him for our salvation. Have you done that this morning? Is that your reality? Do you know that you're going to belong in heaven one day because of what Jesus has done for you? If you're here this morning and you say, I don't know that. That's not my hope. In fact, from what you said, you just added insult to my injury. I see where I'm going and I deserve to be there, dear friend. Turn from your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. He'll make you worthy of God's heaven. Amen. Father, this morning I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. Father, I pray the truth of, of Paul's writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would have its powerful impact in our hearts and lives today. For Christians, Lord, may our, just our hearts be overwhelmed with gratitude and love. Sometimes, Father, I still stand unbelieving wondering how could this actually be true? And you've declared, and we know you cannot tell a lie, that it can be true, and it is true, if we are in Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray if there's anyone in this auditorium this morning who has not turned from their sin and has not yet trusted in Jesus alone for the hope of their salvation, that today would be the day that they would do so. Lord, may they see the perilous position they are in outside of Christ. And may they today flee to him and receive his hope of salvation.
Thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done. We ask this all in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen.